Today, I'm driving the very last model of Triumph ever released. So this, the Acclaim, the last ever Triumph, the first Japanese car built in Europe, and one of the cars I regret not buying most of all when I had the chance as a daily. This may not look like Triumphs you remember because really it's not. Underneath it is very obviously a Honda. They didn't change that much to turn it into a Triumph. The development began in 1978 when Michael Edwards realised they needed something in a bit of a hurry to replace the ageing Maxi Allegro Marina Trio which were looking pretty dated by the end of the 70s and they knew the Maestro Montego was going to be a good five years away probably and they needed a stopgap in a hurry. So. BL started looking around for companies they could work with, similar size, similar segment perhaps, and eventually they hit on Honda. But believe it or not, that wasn't their first choice. They spoke a long time to Renault, they spoke to AMC, they spoke to BMW and Mercedes. In fact, their first choice was Chrysler UK because they considered themselves to be a similar size player in the market. But ultimately Chrysler USA sold Chrysler UK to Peugeot and that put paid to that deal. So in stepped Honda and the Acclaim was born. Now Blade development was already fairly well underway by the time that Michael Edwards signed the paperwork on the agreement on Boxing Day 1979, and the car made it into production in 1981. Now visually, there aren't very many changes between the Honda and the Triumph product. The Honda badge moved from the side to where the Triumph is in the centre. The door handles are a little different, and the wing mirrors are moved onto the doors on the Triumph version as well. The Triumphs were much better spec than the Honda equivalents though, and this being a CD top of the range model, came with headlamp washers. And here's a bit of trivia for you. To keep costs down, the front and rear bumpers are actually identical. Even these holes for the lights are identical, with just rear fogs on the back or blanking plates if it's a low spec car. If you look on the rear of this car, this is actually using a front bumper which has got some blanking plates that have been uh, made for the time being. <laughs> Now building this car in Britain was great for both Honda and for Triumph. For Triumph it gave them a car in a hurry that was already developed and researched and virtually ready to go. Honda on the other hand needed access to the UK and EU market because there were restrictions on the number of imported cars they could bring in and by making the car of 80% locally sourced components they got around that restriction. They had instant access to the European market and so they paved the way for things like the massive Swindon plant, for Nissan, for Toyota, all the other major Japanese players coming into the UK and building cars here. This is the car that created that entire part of the motor industry. Now as I say this is the CD which is the top of the range car. There were four different trim levels L, HL, HLS and here the top of the tree the CD. Now the L version was really 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 basic you didn't even get a clock in the thing but this one the, the CD is absolutely loaded. Uh, post facelift you get a quartz clock before that it was mechanical you get horn <coughs> just about. Um, you get front fog lights, you get electric windows on all four doors, you get remote mechanical obviously um, mirrors, you've got an option of air conditioning which is almost never taken. You've got two sun visors, one with a mirror. You've got a little coin holder. Ooh. You've got little fresh air vents left and right. You flick these little vents here and suddenly you're being air conditioned with beautiful fresh air from outside through the, the side vents. You get an AM radio with cassette. There's so much joy in this car. There's even one of the most bizarre things I've ever heard about. Down here in front of the gear shift you've got a headlamp levelling system which is not too a rare or unusual thing but this one is hydraulic using glycol like antifreeze to hydraulically raise and lower your headlamps. I've never come across that before. Normally it's a little electric motor that will seize up for you. Now the wheelbase on this car is about 94 inches which is barely any bigger than a Metro and so because it's a saloon car shape it's not that big in size. I mean the rear legroom is very small. I'll show you that in a second. The front room is okay but it's very narrow indeed. They use narrower seats in the Triumph over the Honda and I've heard two different versions. Either these seats are based on Cortina seat frames or they're based on Ital seat frames. No one seems to know anymore. If you do know, tell me in the comments. It'll be fascinating to find out. But they are very comfortable. They're very squishy. Not very supportive sideways, but they are not bad. And they've got headrest as well, so they're quite good in case of whiplash and that kind of thing. I'm told this particular seat fabric is very rare indeed. The company that made it went bust a few years ago, and now you can't get it for love nor money. And they used it in Maestros as well, so there's a fair bit of demand for it. So the owner of this car may come back one day and find his seats have been skinned. Over on the driver's door, obviously you've got your door handle to get in and out. Only plastic, not metal this time. Your mechanical window moves 
mover, four electric windows and main on and off, which means the driver can isolate the other windows so the irritating kids in the back won't be fiddling with the windows. On the dashboard, in a very, very Japanese and Honda way, you've got your fuse panel here by your right knee, and you've got a little coin tray as well. This is just pure Honda all the way through. And down here, you've got your buttons for the rear screen heater, rear fogs, and front windscreen washers, all just tucked away a little bit out of sight, but they're not backlit buttons. Instead, there's a tiny little lens with a light behind it, just glowing down like a street light upon them. Isn't that cute? Now you can tell where the Rover R8 dials came from. These are nice, clear uh, speedo and rev counter, but they're not uh, that big. They're, all, they're fairly compact, but they are quite crisp. The needle goes up to 100 miles an hour, and I've variously heard 84 and 100 miles an hour as the top speed. I think 84 was the stated top speed, an auto car once pushed one of these to 100, as far as I can tell from my research. So nominally 84 miles an hour, downhill with a tailwind, it'll go a bit more. That's kind of what I've heard. You've got a decent range of other instruments. You obviously got the rev counter because CD and posh and Japanese, so lots of toys which British cars just weren't getting back then. They were pretty lowly spec. Uh, temperature gauge, fuel gauge, lots of lights, even a boot lid open warning light on this thing, which is good. And we've got our AM radio, quartz clock, massive lighter socket, massive choke. This car's got a choke in it still. And get this out, it's got multiple detents. So if we're cold day, very cold day, or just a little bit cool. How fun is that? Now here in the middle, you've got the choice of two gearboxes. This car thankfully has got the five-speed manual, which is a really nice gear shift, which I'll enjoy running through the gears briefly in a moment. The other option was a three-speed automatic called the Trimatic, or in its real name, the Hondamatic. It was a selectable automatic semi-manual thing, but only three speeds and it's an automatic, so we'll ignore that and stick with the manual because that's where the good stuff lies. Proper ordinary handbrake. And then over here on the left, We've got a tea shelf. Let me get my cup to test it. I have returned. Now, there's no cup holders in this car, but we do have, oh, an unusable tea shelf. Tea shelf fail. If I had a regular mug, I could probably use that on here. I'd, I think you need some fairly dainty um, cups and, and uh, saucers, maybe. I found saucers won't fit there at all. I believe a Costa Medium fits. A Costa Grande fits on there. Uh, I've just been told a Costa Grande will fit on there, but... You know, this, this isn't self-sufficient. You need to bring your own thing. If you're bringing tea, sandwiches, sort of China cups and that kind of thing, you're gonna need using the dull tea set on this one. This is, uh, this is very poor indeed. But this brings me to another point. Uh, the roof line on this car is quite low and this front screen is quite uh, sharply raked. So headroom is also a little bit limited. If I'm like 5'10", 5'11", kind of height, and so if I was any taller, it would start to feel a little bit cramped in here. Poor show on the tea shelf though. Now we've got below the uh, failure of a T-shelf, we've got a reasonably good sized glove box, which has got around 27 tapes in it and some fuses. No door pockets and the speakers are here on the edge of the dashboard angled towards your knees. There's a couple of little clips here on the seat belts, which are quite handy, both, both the front ones. I've got seat belt retaining clips, which means that when you're not using a seat belt, you can just tuck it out of the way and it won't flap annoyingly if the windows are open. Isn't that good? Oh, one final thing. With the ignition off, and you're wondering what the time is, because it's a clock with a LED display rather than a you know, modern LCD or hands, push the bottom half of the clock and the light behind it comes on for a second so you can see what the time is. Now these seats have virtually never been sat in here in the back of the car. Now the knee room is not exemplary. I will <laughs> It's a little bit on the tight side. There is a nice uh, seat back pocket on both seats, which the CD get. I'm not sure the, uh, the L got that, but the uh, seat back itself is a nice height. The headroom is, again, quite tight, but there are hand grips both sides with little slidey back and forthy uh, coat hooks as well. You've got no door pockets, nothing like that at all. You've got electric window switch though, and you've got a little ashtray thing down here. Now this is quite fun. The back seat doesn't fold down, but it has got a ski hatch, but not a ski hatch in the middle like you'd expect. It's here on the left-hand side. So you've got an armrest for one to recline upon. Ah, oh, I am now reclined. There's no seat belts in the back, so you can recline. I'm reclining in my acclaim. Well, you wouldn't be in your acclaim because someone else would be driving it, which would be weird. And it's not really a sofa-driven car. What this is, is a great tea shelf. So you can have a big old picnic here. Uh, we've got segregation for your fork, knife, and spoon, and a small snack area here, ideal for maybe some kind of airline food if you want to eat it off that. Um, it's not a great bit of design, to be perfectly honest, because it's really shallow and a really funny position in the boot. So I've no idea what you put in here. Um, it's, it's never going to be used. It's a weird thing to add to a car. Right, let's look in the boot. 
Now here we are in the truncal area, the back of the car, proper old fashioned boot. Uh, this is a proper three box saloon. So even though BL Triumph really did want to have a hatchback and they, were, they didn't want to admit it to Honda at the time, but they're a little bit disappointed it wasn't a hatchback and was actually a saloon. Um, they kind of had to go with it. It's not a huge boot, it goes back a fairly decent way. I mean, if you were considering a murder, you don't even want to murder a small person because you're not going to get a big guy in the back of here. Now, the owner has uh, worryingly put a bit of thought into this because he's got a genuine accessory Unipart Triumph Acclaim branded boot liner here. So anything messy in the back is going to be protecting the uh, carpet underneath, which is also very original on this car. You've got plastic pockets left and right, and under the floor, there is a full-size spare wheel which is nice. Now you pull your bonnet release catch and the wrong end pops up because this is a front hinged bonnet like on say a Jaguar E-Type. So we're, we're, we're posh here, we're in good company. Now here in the front you will find a transverse mounted rather than longitudinally mounted, so a bit different for Triumph there. Well, 1335cc four cylinder engine which is basically an all Honda unit. It's all aluminium as well and on the Honda version it's got a nice cast You've got a nice cast aluminium rocker cover with Honda cast into it, which looks very smart indeed. On the Triumph version, you've got a rather voluminous pressed tin black painted thing, which gives him some slightly annoying mayonnaise sometimes, which may trick you into thinking you've got head gasket failure, but just gets so big you get condensation in there. But because this is a Honda unit, it doesn't go wrong. In fact, this car holds the perhaps dubious record for the least amount of warranty claims on any British Leyland product. There's a couple of other oddities under here. For example, this massive bottle here isn't the windscreen washers, it's the headlight washers. The little tiny one tucked in behind the battery, that's what you actually need for the window. So uh, bizarre choices made there. The other main difference between this and the Honda engine is of course that this has got twin carbs, only a single on the Honda unit. So this makes about 10 bhp more than the Honda car. Now, thanks to these little twin Cayenne carbs, this 1.4 engine makes 72 horsepower and 80 foot-pound of torque, which is good for 12.9 seconds 0 to 60 and a top speed, as I said before, somewhere between 84 and 100. Right, let's take the thing out on the road. So I've given it a tiny weeny bit of choke here, and it's purring away quite nicely. as twin carbs nice and smooth, unlike this road, which is extremely rutted indeed. And the gear change is very nice as well, very, very crisp. It's got a slightly heavy mechanical feel between one and two, certainly. Oh, let's get the air vents going because it's pretty warm in here. Oh, that's better. And with little vents here as well, get nice fresh air. The ride's not bad at all, actually. This is a bit of a bouncy road, but the, uh, the car's taking it very much in its stride. And 12.9 naught to 60 is not impressive, but it feels a lot more sprightly than that would suggest. Oh, I like the five-speed gearbox in it, that's good. A little bit of wind noise from the doors, but you'll need to input a certain amount of fit and finish to this thing after all. Now it's incredible to think they made over 133,000 of these cars. The last figures I could find were about two or three years old and it showed there's only 390 left and only about 200 on the road and I suspect it's a lot less now. God, you really can tell the honda -ness. it's so quiet and so refined. Bear in mind this is a small family car and yet it's riding with just beautiful smoothness. You know, apart from air conditioning and the, the sat-nav, there's not a lot missing from this car that would be present on a modern luxury vehicle. And you have got velour as well, and who doesn't love velour? I love velour. great thing about BL and Triumph tying up with Honda is that Honda really is an engineering led company like Rover used to be. So when they got this car they got a car with fully independent McPherson strut suspension so it rides fantastically. It's got disc brakes at the front, drum brakes at the rear so the stopping power is quite good as well. And of course the build quality was like nothing British Leyland had ever built before. The cars were built by pressed steel Fisher at Cowley, which is now, of course, where they made the minis. Although there were mumblings 
at the time that it wasn't a proper tribe, it wasn't really British. The fact was it kept thousands of jobs in the country. And it certainly kept the company running long enough for them to continue developing the Maestro Montego. But one thing they did learn from Honda was about production technique and production process. So for the first time, they were designing a car, or well, they had a car given to them designed, maybe a better way to say it, that was designed to be built. It was designed for construction. So the shop floor, the factory floor, could actually put this together sensibly and not have to struggle to build the things. And that meant they built a better product, which even after, well, this car was 1983, so about 37 years old, it's still fairly rattle-free. Now, because this is a Japanese-based car, you do have your indicators here on the right-hand side, along with your headlight switch, and your wipers are here on the left. Here, so. And the, uh, it has the warning lights, are a funny little sliding switch on top. Very curious indeed. Although it took a little while for the British public to come to terms with a foreign influence all over the very British Triumph brand, it was the beginning of a very successful partnership because this car was ultimately replaced by the Rover 200, the SD3 shape, which was in turn replaced by the R8. And in the meantime, from the very beginning, there were plans for a smaller car, which never happened, and a larger car, which became the 800. And of course, the 600 was born of this as well. In fact, it even inspired a line on my merch store, which is the Rover name spelt out in Japanese text. I'll put a link in the description above. I really like that one. It's very subtle. which side of the wind steering wheel indicators are on. Oh, that's tight. Get a U-turn and back down the road. Now, the owner of this car is very enthusiastic about it. He spent a lot of time making it as nice as he possibly can, buying accessories like that floor mat. He's added the... Uh, mud flaps, that kind of thing. He's done his level best to improve a car which is such a rarity now and so hard to find parts for because there are just so few of them left. They only built it for three years, of course. It was introduced in 1981, replaced in 1984 by the SD3 Rover 200, and of course the Maestro Montego. This thing really does ride nicely. I mean, we're getting up to sort of national speed limit kind of speed down this road, and it's just cruising beautifully. And the owner tells me when he bought it, he lives down in the home counties. He bought it in uh, Aberdeen, road tripped it back over two days. And it didn't miss a beat, apparently. I do think it's rather sad that this car is now, well, so forgotten that it's almost slipped from the collective consciousness of the nation because it's a really good car. Reviewers at the time really enjoyed it. They didn't necessarily rate it as being the best handling car in the class, but they certainly appreciated its refined road manners, its quiet cabin, its reliability and the build quality were all really well commented on. And I'm, I'm being harsh saying it doesn't have good handling because it does. It, it, but the turning is sharp, the grip is good. Being front wheel drive, it's nice and safe. It's got predictable understeer handling rather than uh, as our Mark II Escort, which would have happily chucked you off sideways with a lot of oversteer if you got it wrong. This thing's fun. The little twin carb engine revs up beautifully. so quiet and composed. It's easy to forget you're driving a car that's nearly 40 years old. I'm often asked questions like, what would be a good starter classic or an everyday classic I could take to work? And I never have, I've never said buying a claim before, because even I'd kind of half forgotten them, because you just don't see them anymore. But this is great, five-speed gearbox, decent, well, it's not air conditioning, but you know, decent ventilation, electric windows all around, central locking, beautifully reliable Honda electrics and engine, so it's not gonna let you down. The only thing to worry about one of these really is rust. 
um, broken trim, if you're worried about getting all the best bits of trim sorted out, you may be in trouble because there just isn't any. I imagine it's pretty cheap insurance as well if you're a young, a young driver into retro cars because only a one point, well, they call it a 1.4, but it's closer to 1.3 really. And that kind of 80s Japanese styling is so cool right now. It's so much in fashion. You're, you're gonna look good in this thing. I nearly bought one oh, back in the 90s when these were just 300 pound throwaway cars. And I didn't, I bought a Mark III Escort instead. And I, that was such a stupid thing to do because the Mark III Escort was, it was rubbish. It was absolutely trash. It had no extras on it, manual everything, broken most of it. And I don't know why I didn't buy this. I think even back then I was concerned I was going to struggle to get parts for it because I just hadn't seen one in so long. And Triumph obviously wasn't a, a current surviving brand back at that time. Instead of a broken, just rubbish Escort, I could have had a really cool thing with electric windows and reliability and a heater that worked. Uh, if only we could go back and do things again. Now this car from 1983 is a phase two facelift, so there are a couple of very small differences. The steering wheel's a tiny bit different, the gear knob's a tiny bit different, the door handles are a tiny bit different, and the clock's different. They didn't go all out on the facelift. Well, thanks for coming along on this ride for me today. I hope you've enjoyed this, well, one of the most rare cars I've ever driven, really, isn't it? Uh, although they made quite a few of them, there are none left. If you have liked this, please hit like, please hit subscribe, please share with your friends, do all that good stuff. It makes a massive difference to the channel. Get the, uh, all these videos out to new people who've not enjoyed the triumphy British Leylandiness of this channel before. Join me again next time when I have literally no idea what I'll be doing. Because I really, very, very rarely do that in day to day anyway. So the chance of me planning something on this channel is slim to none. Take care everyone, stay safe, and I'll see you soon.